hello welcome back to those who are new to this and welcome a great welcome to those who are new to this channel and our videos sit back chill lax, and let's go today we're going to be talking about who were america's cruelest most cruelest richest slave traders i had never heard of these two individuals never and i stumbled across this um these articles about this isn't it's, it's kind of scarce actually you have to really do a lot of digging to get you know some good information on these two individuals and it's kind of peculiar as to why i saw an article and it was titled subtitled why weren't these individuals talked about um yeah that's the question i would like to know so this country seems to like to do a lot of dl bragging about slavery under the guise of um education but to me it seemed a little sadistic why weren't isaac franklin and john ormfield talked about you know you know, this country wants to paint a picture like, you know, that was then. Now, you know, that was the evils of our ancestors. They committed this vile act of slavery, which we do not approve of. But, you know, every time we look around, you're doing these little mundane, like, um, docile slavery movies highlighting how docile some slaves were. And it's rare that we'll get a movie of, um, a person that was in slavery that fought back. It's almost like you still want to keep black folks docile and keep black folks separated because the biggest fear from the things that I've researched and discovered, the um, consensus was that a lot of white folks was terrified about black folks congregating and possibly revolting. That was one of the biggest fears. Um, there was a state um, where the white, the consensus of the white people in that state, I'm not going to say the state because I'm planning on doing a um, video on it, but the consensus of the white folks in that state, two of two fears they had, they were afraid that black people would not, when black people were free, they were not going to help them with their plantations, with farming and their crops. And, you know, basically a lot of their crops are going to die if they didn't have the hands of black folks helping them. And two, they feared they wanted all free black people out of their states because they feared a revolt. <laughs> so the the aggression that has been coming against black folks since after slavery, mainly after slavery, that's when it just got more hellish the brutality against black people it's because there was a fear you know how that is when when you have um done someone so wrong you you know you did them wrong and you fear them coming back that was that's the mentality that was the mentality and it's still prevalent today let somebody tell you it's not so they're lying okay let's get into this story through the age of the American Revolution and continuing for a generation thereafter, enslavers in places such as South Carolina and Georgia met many of their labor demands by importing enslaved people from Africa and the Caribbean, white migrants to new western territories and to states like Kentucky and Tennessee tended to bring enslaved laborers with them when they moved. At the same time, the American banking system was immature and undercapitalized, which limited capital for large scale transactions. There were men who worked as domestic slave traders, but large professional slave trading businesses were nearly unheard of until the early 19th century. Those circumstances started to change in the decades after the closing of the legal transatlantic slave trade in 1808. When Congress outlawed the transatlantic trade, it did nothing to contain domestic traffic in enslaved people. 
and provided customs regulations designed to ensure that anyone sent by ship between domestic ports had been legally imported. This effectively created a protected and federally sanctioned market for the slave trade inside the boundaries of the United States. And it did so precisely at a moment when demand for enslaved laborers was skyrocketing in lower south white farmers there were moving rapidly into portions of the continent acquired in the louisiana purchase in 1803 and using the cotton gin and the steam powered sugar mills to produce increasing volumes of cotton and sugar for global markets Military victories and diplomatic concessions acquired and rested with the British and numerous Indian nations during the War of 1812 solidified American regional sovereignty and provided additional security for those farmers. Cotton and sugar growers saw enslaved labor as indispensable to the success of their enterprise and the inability to acquire enslaved people from abroad created unprecedented opportunities for men to traffic and deal in the enslaved domestically. Slave children receive harsh punishment not dissimilar from those meted out to adults. They might be whipped or even required to swallow worms. They failed to pick off cotton or tobacco. During the adolescence, a majority of slave youth were sold or hired away. Let's continue. Franklin and Ornfell was the largest and most powerful domestic slave trading company in the United States between 1828 and 1836, and it was likely the largest and most powerful in American history. Franklin and Ornfield not only ravaged the lives and families of the enslaved men, women, and children, and bought and sold. They also transformed the domestic slave trade from a haphazard short-term pursuit into an organized profession, demonstrating the trade's capacity as a big business whose violence and exploitations could generate enormous profits and social respectability for its operators. For decades after Franklin and Armfield shut down, its business model served as the template for dozens of interstate domestic slave trading companies and set the standard for an especially malevolent form of American entrepreneurship. Slave trading was a game. The men, Isaac Franklin and John Armfield, were daring pirates or one-eyed men a euphemism for their penises. The women they bought and sold were fancy maids, a term signifying youth, beauty, and potential for sexual exploitation by buyers or the traders themselves. You know what? I was told a long time ago that I can't remember who told me. It was an older person, of course. That's why some of you folks, you know, this country society kind of like shuns older people but that's where you get your wisdom from and knowledge you know because honestly when you're in your 20s you think you know a lot but you don't realize you didn't know a lot until you get out of your 20s you realize kind of how ignorant and dumb you were real talk you know because when I I remember one time (laughs) I was doing an internship at this clinic and I was under 25 and uh, one of the nurses I was saying something to her I can't remember what I was saying to her and she said she asked me how old I was I told her she said um when you turn 25 then you know you can talk to me something she said like that and at that point in time I just I felt so I felt like a child like oh my god that's how you see me wait till I turn 25 And then when I got out of my 20s, I was just like, damn, I really didn't know a lot, huh? I thought I did, but you kind of still kind of like, you're in, when you're in your 20s, it's like you're coming out of your teens into baby adulthood. 
It's a lot you don't know. Now, that's one issue, one of many issues I have with this country and society. It's being instilled in young adults to not have respect and listen to older, the older generation. And that's one way you learn. When you have someone wise and mature and older, with sophist- more sophisticated, that's how you learn a lot. Books can only teach you so much. School can only teach you so much. How you actually learn is actually going out there experiencing and then speaking to people who have been there. So when you when you shun adults, when you shun older people, it's like you you like foolish to me, very foolish. What I don't like about this country and this history of slavery, especially particularly how they paint the picture of black women, so just so um, whorish. I was told, like I said, I was told years ago that men turn women into whores. And if you had the opportunity to speak to, or you've had the ability to speak to a woman who, a woman of the night, call girl, high class hooker, or someone walk, someone walking a stroll, you ask her, how does she end up being there? I remember years and some time ago, my sister and I are into documentaries, actually filming documentaries. And we were working on a documentary and we were go, we would go out to, on the streets at night. I'm Figueroa. Anybody who's from L.A., Southern California, you know what Figueroa is. So we would go out there and interview. The majority of the women we spoke to, um, they were on the street either because they had a negative relationship with their mother in their household, just had a bad altogether household, or a man put them out there. A, a man turned them out and put them out there. And one of my many issues with slavery is how white men turned black women out, made them into whores, concubines, prostitutes. And then a lot of them fabricated this this false image of black women. And that was a way, that was a rule to cover up what they were doing to black women, pretending that black women were just highly sexual. And that was their excuse for violating black women. That was their cover-up, pretending like black women were highly sexual, and that's why they could have their way with them, which was not true at all. Let's continue. Uh, what sexual assaults happen often. To my certain knowledge, she has been used and at that smartly by a one-eyed man about my size and age. Excuse my foolishness, Isaac Franklin's nephew James, an employee, and his uncle's protege wrote in typical business correspondence referencing to Caroline Brown, an enslaved woman who suffered repeated sexual assault and abuse at James' hands for five months. She was 18 at the time and just over five feet tall. Franklin and Ormfield, who headquartered their slave trading business in a townhouse that still stands in Alexandria, Virginia, so more enslaved people separated more families and made more money from the trade than almost anyone else in America. Between the 1820s and 1830s, the two men reigned as the undisputed tycoons of the domestic slave trade, Smithsonian Magazine put it. And why are these, um, these old slave trading businesses still standing today? Slave plantations still standing today. Slave pens still standing today. Slave cabins. Why are they still erect? You gotta ask yourself this question. If this country has such a distaste against slavery, oh, it was such a wicked, vile institution, why do you still have these businesses that were um, used for such a heinous thing as slavery? Why are these things, why are these buildings, locations still existing today? Why haven't they been all torn down? See, that's what makes me think that when they say they how much they detested slavery and detested what their ancestors did, it's just something they say out of their mouths. But if they actually had an issue with it, those plantations wouldn't still be erected. Why would they be considered historical when 
the most heinous, vile things were done to them on these plantations and these slave pens and these slave trading businesses. Why are they still erected? Let's continue. Americans are forced to confront the brutality of slavery and other people who profited from it. Few profited it more than the two Virginian slave traders. Their success was immense. The two amassed a fortune worth several billions in today's dollars and retired as two of the nation's wealthiest men, according to Joshua Rothman, a professor of history at the University of Alabama, who was writing a book on Franklin and Arnfield. Several factors set the pair apart. Rothman explained, for one, t- for one thing, their timing was impeccable. They got into the domestic slave trade just as the cotton economy and American demand for enslaved labor exploded and quite right before the United States sank into the financial panic of 1837. Their location was also prime, perched so they could collect enslaved people from plantations across Virginia and Maryland and sending them on forced marches in groups of several hundred known as coffles are on tightly packed ships along the Atlantic coast to the deep south. While their business strategy was not especially innovative, it was conducted on a scale bigger and better than anyone else, Rothman said. Franklin and Armfield transported an estimated 10,000 enslaved people over the course of their careers, according to Rothman. In the cold mountain in Mun, the novel's Odessian wanderer comes across a peddler who tells him of the cruelty he has seen in his travels through the deep south. Introducing his story with the claim, you've never seen the like of meanness I have. A searing assumption in the face of Inman tells of battle from Fredericksburg to Petersburg, the peddler catalogs the inhuman treatment of slaves he has witnessed in Mississippi. He told of negresses burnt alive, of them having ears and fingers docked for various misdemeanors. The worst such punishment he came upon was near Natchez. He was going down a lonely road near the river. Off in the woods, he heard a turmoil of buzzards, a high well. He took his shotgun and went investigating, and what he found was a woman in a cage made of bean poles beneath a live oak. The tree was dusty with buzzards. They roosted on the cage and picked at the woman inside. They had pulled out one of her eyes already and had torn strips of hide from her back and arm. When she saw the peddler out of one of her eyes, she hollered, shoot me. Let's continue. They're the ones who turned the business of selling humans from one part of the U.S. to another into a very modern organized business, no longer just one trader who might move a few people from one plantation to another, said Maurice D. McInnes, a professor at the University of Texas at Austin who studies the cultural history of slavery. They created a modern machinery to support the business of human trafficking. That was possible largely because of the traders' willingness to be unusually cruel and heartless, even for a business built around the sale of human beings. As they committed atrocities, they appeared to relish. In surviving correspondence, they actually brag about sexually assaulting enslaved people who they've been processing through the firm, said Calvin Shermanhorn a professor of history at Arizona State University. This seemed to be as much a part of Franklin and Armfield's culture of business as, say, going to the bar after a successful court case might be the culture of a successful law firm's business. Yet today, almost no one knows their names. When Franklin and Armfield retired, they passed easily into elite white society, achieving respectable dotage without a murmur history too has largely let them off scot-free Shermer horn said few if any american high school or college students ever learn about the duo 
And that's why you got to ask your, your question, why? Again, I'm going to keep saying, while I'm talking about the history of um, this vile institution in this country, I'm going to keep asking a question. If slavery wasn't that bad, like some of these lying, paid prostitutes, I was about to say prostitution. As some of these lying paid politicians say, why haven't you heard about these two and other vile individuals such as them? You gotta wonder. You gotta sometimes stop and think and stop letting these people open up your head figuratively and pour this nonsense in it. Let's continue. I think I think America continues to be uncomfortable talking about the original sin of slavery, MacInnen said. And this is one of the most horrific chapters. As I said in a number of videos, I believe, and watch, it's going to be proven true. I believe that there are some vile, vicious things that have never been disclosed before about slavery. And one day it's going to come out. Watch. The slave trade was all Isaac Franklin the slave trade was all Isaac Franklin ever knew. He was born in 1789 to a wealthy planter family in Tennessee that owned a significant number of enslaved people, according to Rothman, in his late teens, right around the time the United States passed a law barring the transatlantic slave trade. Franklin and his older brothers grew interested in the domestic version. They began transporting small numbers of enslaved people between Virginia and the Deep South. Could you imagine him having a a discussion with his family yeah dad you know i know they're born the transatlantic slave trade but hey you know i had an idea and his father was like mm, that sounds great franklin let's go ahead and try it let's continue franklin developed a taste for the business and after taking a brief break to fight in the war in 1812 dedicated himself to slave trading full time it was all he did for the rest of his professional life right up until he retired his brothers never got back into the slave trade but isaac really decides this is going to be his game he's good at it he likes it he can make money at it he sticks with it rotham said Franklin worked with a few partners over the years, but connected with his longest lasting collaborator, the man who became his closest friend, confidant, and nephew by marriage in the early 1820s. At the time, John Ormfield was lacking in purpose, shiftless and footloose. He had recently been chased away from a county in North Carolina for fathering a child out of wedlock, Rothman said. It seemed like how many non-white men have the opportunity to feel what it feels like to be shiftless and footloose without being called, you know, lazy and, you know, thugs. A white man, a young white man can be shiftless and footloose and people just pat him on the back and say, hey, don't worry about it. Yeah, he might not have direction now, but he'll get there. Don't worry about it. He has a bright, he has a bright future. But let that be someone else non-white. Might as well give it up. He's, he's incorrigible. He'll never be anything. Let's continue. His path to the slave trade was less clear-cut from Franklin's. Born in 1797 to Quakers who formed several hundred acres in North Carolina and owned a small number of enslaved people. Ooh, even the Quakers is in the game. Ormfield spent his early adulthood pursuing a variety of unsuccessful ventures, including a small mercantile shop, which he was forced to abandon after his affair. Though unsure what he wanted to do, Ormfield was clear on what he didn't. He loathed Foreman, so floundering about in the wake of the sex scandal. Ormfield decided he would just dabble in the slave trade according to Rothman. Franklin and Armfield met a few years after that in the course of business and immediately developed a rapport, Rothman said, an intimacy that continued for decades and fueled their profitability. In 1834, the two men became family when Armfield married Franklin's niece. They are each other's closest friends and that's rooted in their working relationship, Rothman said. 
part of the reason they're successful is they work well together. Each understand the other's strengths. They trust and respect each other. Yeah, and they was doing a lot of freaky stuff together, too. Can you imagine? I'm sure they was having, ugh. That's why they worked so close together. The two men launched the slave trading firm Franklin and Ormfield and moved into the Alexandria Townhouse, today a museum. In 1828... From the beginning, they divvied the work according to each man's strength. Armfield, based in Virginia, managed the buying side of things and arranged transportation, Rothman said. Franklin, meanwhile, stayed mostly in Natchez, Mississippi, and was responsible for selling their human cargo to plantations in the Deep South. It worked like this, relying on a network of headhunters spread across Virginia, Maryland, and the district Armfield would round up enslaved people holding them in an open air pen behind the house of alexandria or sometimes in its crowded filthy basement until he amassed a significant number usually between 100 and 200 then he'd send the group on an on a ordrious 1000 mile march to slave market hold up hold up a uh, what what he, he, I'm, well, I'm trying to process this. I'm, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to, no, you ask, I, I really, this animal, this monster sent them on a thousand, a one thousand mile march to slave markets in Natchez or New Orleans. Who the hell? Who did he pay to march these people a thousand miles? Okay, let me continue. Or he'd stuff them into one of the company's three massive ships to make the same journey by water. At the peak of their business, the two men were moving roughly 1,000 people a year, historians said. They placed ads in local newspapers seeking enslaved people almost every single day they remained in business they developed cruel stratagems to boost their bottom line for example they designated less space per person on their ships than the transatlantic slave trade vessels did Shermer horn said while enslaved people waited in franklin and ormfield's holding pen in alexandria the two men most likely adopted classic techniques employed by slave trader to enhance enslaved people's sellability mcinnis said that meant feeding their captives large amounts of corn pone and pork to fatten them up dyeing gray hair black so they look younger and if an enslaved person's skin was scarred with whip marks smearing wax into the wound so they looked healthier according to mcinnis the whole thing was so evil mcinnis said through it all both regularly sexually assaulted women they bought and sold and joked about it in letters a shared habit that deepened their friendship franklin and armfield each father at least one child when an enslaved woman rothman said he suspects the abuse which had no financial purpose stemmed from a desire for raw power they did it because they could and they felt like it a whole lot I want to say but in regards to this aforementioned paragraph I just read I, but I'm not I'm, I'm really not gonna go there let's continue when Franklin wed a rich socialite in 1839 he had been sexually assaulting the same enslaved woman for about five years and had fathered a child with her Rothman said Franklin sold the enslaved woman and her baby right after his wedding her fate is unknown one of the most persistent misconceptions about slavery in the United States is that the white upper class refused to associate with slave traders on principle, Rothman said. 
a myth the case of franklin and ormfield disproves even while actively trading slaves the two men enjoyed an excellent reputation and moved in top tier social circles according to rothman franklin went to the theater with other rich whites and drew dinner parties earning a reputation as a gregarious host with the best liquors rothman said Ornfield may have been less extrovert, but he too drew accolades for his social graces. When visitors came to the Alexandria townhouse, he always opened the door for them, made elegant small talk, and offered them something nice to drink, McInnes said. What he just said goes back to what I said. I can't remember precisely which video I said it in, but I said, you have so many people that claim to not like the vile institution of slavery, but why did it go on for hundreds of years? And I made an example of how crack was to black families, you know? In the beginning it was like, oh no, I don't want this blood money. And then when they saw what they could do, you know, black people being so doggone poor, most of them being so doggone poor, they embraced it. They turned a blind eye and embraced it. And that's what I think a lot of people did in regards to slavery. You, you know how many people got wealthy out of slavery? They didn't even, you didn't have to be an enslaver to get rich. You can be a, um, a business. In the business of slavery, they needed things. They needed materials. They needed property. They, made, they needed land, furniture, homes. The money these enslavers made and slave traders made boosted the economy for everybody. So that's why I was able to go on. Whenever you're dealing with large amounts of money and people are benefiting from that, trust. Uh, you, you'll be surprised what people can turn a blind eye to, like child trafficking. Need I say more? You'd be surprised how many people are involved in this child trafficking. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a topic for another time. Let's continue. He was so smooth, he managed to impress even a New England abolitionist who visited Alexandria in the 1830s. What I just say? An abolitionist. Who doesn't know what abolition? That's all we learned about. We learned about slavery and abolitionists. Yeah, there was slavery, folks. But we had some good-hearted white people that was against it. But he impressed an abolitionist. Isn't that a contradiction? You're fighting against the vile institution of slavery, but yet you were thoroughly impressed with this enslaver. Wow. The abolitionist, knowing full well Armfield's profession, nonetheless wrote, He is a man of fine personal appearance and of engaging and graceful manners. But he is a slave trader. Franklin and Armfield employed several business tactics instituted by other slave traders before them most notably austin woolfolk a baltimore-based trader who dominated the slave trade in the chesapeake bay region for much of the 1820s but franklin and ormfield quickly bypassed wool folk by doing much of what he did only bigger and better franklin ornfield's headquarters in alexandria for example was massive taking up half a square block on duke street the walled compound included a three-story federal style townhouse that served as the business office separate housing and pens for male and female captives kitchens stables a hospital and a tailor shop in which in Slave women made clothing for captives to wear on their arrival in the Lower South. Wow, they made enslaved women sew clothes for the captives. It was a facility dedicated to carrying out the domestic slave trade on an industrial scale. In his notes of a tour in America in 1832 and 1833, Stephen Davis recalls seeing enslaved captives at a depot at Alexandria where they are penned like cattle and brought and sold the abolitionist Ethan Allen Andrews visited Franklin and Ornfield's compound in July 1835 and compared it to a penitentiary with the same apparatus of high walls and bolts and bars to secure the prisoners. 
Franklin and Armfield also regularly advertised their willingness to pay top dollar for enslaved laborers. Their network of purchasing agents ranged throughout the Chesapeake region with men scattered across more than 20,000 square miles of Maryland and Virginia. These agents delivered enslaved individuals to Alexandria where Armfield made shipping arrangements to dispatch them to New Orleans where Franklin had relocated in 1829 and set up what would become a sizable stockade just outside what is now the French Quarter. Franklin sold some of the enslaved people in New Orleans and sent others by steamboat. Among Franklin and Ornfield's agents, none was more important than Rice Ballard, born in 1800 in Spotsylvania County near Fredericksburg, Ballard started working as a long-distance slave trader in the early 1820s. In the early 1830s, he became the third partner in Franklin and Ornfield and the face of the company in Richmond, which was emerging as a vital node of the domestic slave trade. Employing his own network of sub-agents, Ballard brought people in and around the Virginia Virginia capital and sent them by steamboat down to James River to Norfolk. There they were added to the Ormfield shipments and sent to the Lower South where Isaac and James Franklin sold them under the name of an associated entity known as Franklin Ballard and Company. Shipping via the coast was a critical element of Franklin and Ormfield's business model. Although the company never abandoned moving enslaved people via the coffle system near the end of every summer and sent anywhere from several dozen to several hundred people overland to the lower south to be sold at the outset of the sales season in the early fall but mostly the company relied on packing people into sailing ships for the three-week voyage from virginia to louisiana initially the company rented space on ships or chartered them but eventually their partners purchased a small fleet of their own comprising three brigs especially outfitted to be slavers the tribune the Ancus and the third displaying the commercial swagger that was a company trademark the isaac franklin at its peak in the middle of the 1830s the company operated by franklin armfield and ballard transported the cell between 1000 and 1500 enslaved people every year at one point they were sending a shipload of enslaved people to new orleans every two weeks for months at a time in the chesapeake region their network of agents gave them an unmatched grip on regional purchases of enslaved people in the lower south franklin bragged that the company sold more enslaved people in natchez than all other slave traders put together a visitor in 1835 estimated that franklin and ornfield sold two-thirds of all the enslaved people brought to the city in the previous decade new orleans was a larger market in, in which it was harder to acquire such an outsized share but during the years of franklin worked but during the years franklin worked in that city he sold as much as 20 percent of all the enslaved people sold by out of state traders some of franklin and ornfield's success was a matter of timing the first five or six years of the 1830s saw the biggest economic boom the united states has seen to that point and the heart of that boom lay in the land and slave labor and cotton economies of the lower south franklin and armfield was positioned to make maximal advantage of the demand from white farmers for enslaved people the company also prospered because its partners were shrewd businessmen who grasped in equal measure the slave trades inhumane brutalities and its business considerations franklin ornfield and ballard assessed enslaved people solely as commodity they could exploit the profit whether marketed as field laborers or skilled workers are offered as part of the fancy trade in enslaved women sold for purposes of sexual exploitation that command over the process of turning people into goods of being able to disregard their human qualities and pain and reckon them properly to maximize profit 
was critical to their success. It was part of a skill set that included Armfield's capacity to oversee the logistic of a complicated shipping operation in Franklin's penetrating understanding of money markets which allowed the company to establish credit lines with major banks manage hundreds of thousands of dollars and navigate the ebbs and flows of the larger american economy it was an intricate undertaking and even as it was immensely successful it was fragile not paying close attention or taking a few false steps could leave the company with too little money or too many enslaved people at the wrong time and the entire operation could collapse ultimately it was that very fragility that helped prompt the partners to leave the slave trade even as they were at the peak of their power in 1834 shocks of national financial markets that came amid the political battle over the second bank of the united states left franklin and armfield's potential customers without money to spend forcing the company to sell enslaved people almost entirely on credit which made the partners rich on paper but short on cash the economy eventually stabilized but franklin was over 40 years old had been dealing in enslaved labor for more than 25 years and had already been thinking about retiring market uncertainties helped give him the final push late in 1834 franklin and arfield started telling their purchasing agents that their services would no longer be required in the summer of 1835 franklin formally retired and ornfield and ballard neither of them neither of whom wanted to continue without him took charge of winding down the business in november 1836 ornfield sent his last shipment of enslaved people to new orleans after which he sold the company's brigs to other slave traders turned control of the alexandria headquarters over to a former agent named george kephart and began to focus on collecting outstanding bills from customers the duke street complex however would be used continuously as a slave trading facility until the american civil war 1861 to 1865 in the course of nearly nine years of operation the partners in franklin and Ornfield both moved and sold more than 8,500 enslaved people with the number of enslaved people the partners dealt in before they began working together are included in the tally franklin armfield and ballard bore direct responsibility for the forced displacement and sale of well over 10,000 human beings during their careers in the slave trade no other traders of their era came close their successors however would certainly try franklin armfield and ballard all eased into retirement as as extraordinarily rich and respected men and <laughs> hold up hold up the business they was in it was just like dope dealers they were nothing but dope dealers and they were highly respected you see how that goes because they were white men they were highly respected okay let's continue and other traders aimed to emulate them the slave trade continued to evolve after franklin and armfield ceased to do business new technologies like the railroad and the telegraph for example allowed the business to spread into interior markets that had been relatively isolated by the 1850s there were also many more large trading companies that but the formula that franklin armfield and ballard had pioneered sizable trading businesses with headquarters in key cities that received enslaved laborers from a network of purchasing agents utilized shipping or rail service to move their human cargo and integrated their operations with sprawling credit and banking system remained the underpinning by the time the civil war ended the domestic slave trade in the united states once and for all more than one million enslaved people had been taken into forced migrations across state lines and at least twice as many were exchanged within the boundaries of individual states no single company did more than franklin and armfield to show those thousands of white men who were willing to devastate the lives of the enslaved 
how to make their wanton cruelty and business pay off. Franklin divided his retirement in a large mansion he built in Tennessee and several Louisiana plantations he acquired over the course of his career. He whiled away his final years, managing his estates and spending time with his three children and wife, Adelicia Hayes, whom records indicate he adored. Franklin died in 1846 of intestinal issues. Ormfield, meanwhile, purchased an old hotel in the Tennessee mountains and converted it to a luxury summer getaway for the wealthy. He ran it with great success in his final years, earning visits from very prominent people, including archbishops and the mayor of Nashville, according to Rothman. Ormfield's hotel, which still stands is used to host events including the Methodist retreats. He died of old age in 1827. Ornfield's marriage never yielded any children and Franklin's children with Hayes all died without producing offspring according to Rothman so the two men have no direct white descendants living today. Ornfield has at least one direct black descendant Rodney Williams who wrote about his heritage which he said is discovered through DNA testing in an essay included in Slavery's Descendants published in May. A group of Franklin's direct white descendants learned of their relationship to the slave trader a few years ago and in 2018 donated money and relics to the Alexandria Museum located where their ancestors' business once stood. Neither Franklin nor Ornfield earned recrimination from their peers during their lifetimes, and neither man felt the slightest remorse according to their papers. It never occurs to them to think slavery might be bad. Slavery is what made their society work and made them rich. It was a given that was what black people were for. Rothman said there's no indication anywhere in the record that they felt guilty over what they did sometimes Rothman finds it difficult to keep going he is loath to spend yet another day probing the dark activities and darker minds of Franklin and Armfield then he remembers why he wanted to write the book People are still talking about how the slave trade was marginal. Slave traders were these ostracized dirt bags. And slaveholders only bought and sold people when they had to. Rothman said, those kinds of stubborn myths, they need demolition. Exactly what I said. What he said that people want to make it seem like slave traders were just like, oh, they were the scum of the earth people didn't really deal with them that is a lie like i keep asking i keep saying why did this institution if it was so vile a lot of white people claim to just be so ashamed of what their ancestors did why did it go on so long why do you still have these so-called monuments up slave pens and plantations all scattered around the country keeping them pristine they keep some of these plantations looking better than than uh, modern homes why you keep these places looking so pristine if you're so ashamed of them why aren't they bulldozed down they represent an evil vile part of this dark history right why are they taken care of like they're in a museum it's not adding up and like i said these slaves are just like dope dealers they benefited the economy a lot of people made money and got rich off of the slave game, whether you was a slave trader or not. So y'all need to stop lying. All you're doing is compounding the compounding crime. If you're not lying about it and diluting it, you're trying to cover it up. It's like, when the hell are you going to stop? You had over 400 years to make this right, and nobody has barely lifted a finger to make it right. That tells me a whole lot. You're showing your true colors.